All right. It was one of those days where you just, you could just lay down and sleep for about 40 years, right? Everybody's kind of wore out, you know. We're glad to have you here. Don't forget to visit our website at lyitil.org, lovingthelord.org. And so tonight's kind of a unique message based on the Word of God. Uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. Uh, this has to deal with the river of the sanctuary. And we're going to be talking about getting in over your head. Getting in over your head. So this is a great little Bible study tonight on, like I said, Ezekiel chapter 47, the river of the sanctuary. And Catherine and Jane, so glad to have you guys. You all are so faithful. Thanks for being here. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 47, and we're going to begin to read uh, out of Ezekiel, verse number 1. And Lupi, he says, afterwards he brought me again unto the door of the house. Underline that. Where did God bring him? To the door of of the house. Look at this right here. And behold, he says, the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. The Ezekiel says, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east. And the waters came down from uh, under, uh, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way about uh, with, uh, without unto the other gate by the way that he looked eastward, unto eastward. And he says, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. So this, this is kind of a challenging vision that he got, okay? He said, I was at the door, I was at the, you know, the sanctuary, and these waters were coming out of it. Notice, nothing flowed into it, everything flowed out of it. And he says in verse 3, and and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters. Now underline this. The waters were what? To the ankles. Did you get that? Uh, so this is a millennial vision uh, coming from Ezekiel. Ezekiel is envisioning a time when the Lord will bring about known as the absolute healing of the nation of Israel, a time when the rivers of God, God's grace and blessings, uh, will flow from His throne, and, and they're going to refresh the promised land. And so while this prophecy is for, is for the nation of Israel, it will literally be fulfilled in one day. And there is an application here for us tonight. So verse 3 says, And the waters were to the ankles. Verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 47. Now I do read out the King James Version Bible. And he says, And again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to where? To the knees. It went from the ankles to the knees. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. They were to the loins. So in other words, he's getting a little deeper as he goes on with this vision. And Michaela okay, says, Afterwards I measured a thousand and it, there was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, and the river that could not be passed over. Notice it's going to sweep him away. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. And, and he says, verse 7, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said unto me, These waters issued out toward the east country and going down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be what? Healed. Now, it's important that you understand that, Lady Karen, there's a purpose for this vision. He's, he's talking about bringing healing to the uh, nation of Israel but it's even deeper than that for you and I today. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whatsoever the river shall come, shall what? Live. They're going to come alive. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed. In other words, they're going to bring forth life. They're going to be healed. They're going to be uh, functioning again. And he says, Everything shall live whether the river so whatever the river touches, Lupi, is going to come live. Okay, Verse 10, And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand uh, upon it, 
from Engera even unto Enaglaum, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as a fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. In other words, he says there's going to be so many blessings you can't even contain it. Verse 11, but the miry places, that's the muddy places, and the, and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Now then he says, now these areas aren't going to be refreshed by the waters. That there's going to have to be a special cleansing that's going to take place. And he says in verse 12, uh, verse 11, I'm sorry, and they shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It, uh, it shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. Notice, underline that. Where did they come from? Right, he says, but they issued out of the what? The sanctuary. That's why when we begin to read in Ezekiel chapter 47, hi, Starla, glad to have you. We're in Ezekiel chapter 47 is the river of the sanctuary. The very essence of life is coming from God in order to bring healing, not only to the nation of Israel, but all to you and I who are listening today. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat and the leaf thereof for medicine. So whenever you, you think about this, we need to get to a place where uh, we get in over our head. And I'll explain that to you as we go. This is a millennial vision that Ezekiel is talking about when the Lord is going to bring absolute healing to the nation of Israel. And he's going to do it very quickly. So by the way of introduction here, allow me to share the following personal illustrations with you. Many years ago, Lady Karen, I, I remember as a, as a child that uh, uh, there was a big old huge swimming pool in a little town called Eastland, Texas. Now, it was big to me. Loopy is like a little mud puddle right now. But I was just a child. And I remember uh, jumping in over into what we call the deep end. Everybody remember doing that? And everything went well for a while until all of a sudden I got really tired. And I got exhausted. And I went under the water. And I remember thinking, I'm not going to make it out of this. And so what I learned as a young child is that you got to be careful getting in over your head. You better know what you're doing. You better have a way out, right? And so it was either sink or swim. And so what I did, I kind of kind of paddled and waddled and got to the side of the shore to, to where I can get a hold of something. You know, Ezekiel's talking about this vision, how that, uh, and this is the, the rivers that came out of the sanctuary. And as we read, remember, he got swept away. But then God brought him to the, to the bank of the shore, something to get a hold of. And I want to hope and pray that you and I will get a hold of something tonight that comes from God that's going to turn us around and help us in our life. In fact, I'd like to ask you a question. How many of you can honestly raise your hand and say, you know without a shadow of a doubt that you were 100% in the middle of God's will? Well, nobody's going to raise their hand with that one. You know, the truth of the matter is that we have plenty of room for improvement. Somebody say amen. We have plenty of room for improvement. And that's what this sermon is all about this evening. In fact, it's about becoming more of what the Lord God wants uh, from each of us. And the process in which God's going to take us through to get us there. All right. It's about leaving the shore that is stagnant. And, dis, and uh, the, the shore that is what we call disappointing Christianity, all right? And wading out into a little bit deeper spiritual waters and, 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 and understanding what this born-again life is really all about. You see, that's what is happening in the modern church is that many have become too far cautious about giving their all to Jesus Christ. They're on the bank. They're not willing to step out by faith and see just exactly where that faith will take them and how they'll grow from it. In fact, they're not even afraid to get in over their heads, right? But let's take a few minutes this evening to look at Ezekiel's prophecy. This is a prophecy. And I want to notice three aspects of the prophecy that apply to you and I this evening. And if you'll take the time to continue with us in this sermon, I think at the end of it, you're going to see what God has in store for all of us. What I'd like to do is to help you to what, what's called wade out a little bit deeper. 
wade out a little bit deeper. If you're in, if you're in your religious settings and you feel stagnant, you feel like yes, you're not going nowhere, well, God's going to show you a way to go through the process of God that your, your understanding of God, your experience of God, all the things you're going through right now, He said, I want to take you to a deeper level than where you are. Not just going to church. Not just reading a little bit of your Bible every now and then or a few sermon notes. But he says, I have a vision. I have a vision. What did he vision? Well, Victoria, first of all, he saw a river. He visioned a river. A river that's a type, loopy, of the Holy Spirit. So when you go back and think about this, in John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, there are three ways in which the river represents the Spirit and his work in the life of the believer. So, first of all, if he saw a river, the first thing it said, Lady Karen, he saw its source. What was the source? Michaela, what was the source? It was the throne of God. The throne of God. And, and the Holy Spirit is like that river. It came directly from uh, the Father's throne. Listen, you're not going to get the Holy Spirit experience just because you go to church. You're not going to get just because you got a big old huge Bible about this big. All right? But you're going to get it from the very presence of God. So Ezekiel said, I saw a river, but then I saw the source. Today, you and I need to get back to seeing the source of why we come to church. The source of why we read our Bibles. The source of why we dedicate ourselves to God. So in its source was the throne of God. Not only do we see its source, but we see its course. Why is that? What was the course? Why, Lupe, it was from the altar. That was the altar. Notice that the river came from the altar. What is the altar? It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of sacrifice where sacrifices are made. And the water of life, the precious Holy Spirit, comes directly from the altar of Christ's sacrifice. In order for you to get saved, Jesus had to die for you. And then you, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you don't get the Holy Ghost because you went to church or you jumped in some water. You understand? You, you get the Holy Ghost because that's, that's Christ in spiritual form coming into your life. So once again, this precious Holy Spirit comes directly from the altar of Christ's sacrifice, the cross. You can read more about it in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. But the Holy Spirit came only... After the death of Christ on the cross. In John 16, 7. You ought to go back and read it. People say, well, I, I want to experience the Holy Spirit. Well, you can't. Unless you experience Jesus Christ. Once you receive Christ, your Savior, He gives you the Holy Spirit of God. Then and only then can, can your spirit and His spirit begin to commune together. So he's, when Ezekiel said, I saw a river. Not just any river, but a river. The river from the sanctuary. I saw its source. It was the throne of God. I saw its course as it came down from the altar. And then he saw the force of this water. You see, notice there are four great things about the river that, that made it very special. In fact, we find here these four things make the Holy Spirit very special as well. First of all, listen, it had no feeder streams. Now let me explain that to you. What is a feeder stream? Normally you have these little streams that come down as they come together, they begin to form a little, maybe two or three foot path, and then it turns into a seven or eight foot path. And in other words, it comes from the mountains and it forms a stream that eventually turns into a river. But he said this river didn't have that. There was nothing feeding the throne of God. There was no, in fact, everything was coming from the throne of God. And it had, had no feeder streams. That, so there was no need for anything to flow into the river to give it force or to give it size or to give it power. When, when, uh, uh, when, we, when it's left alone, it, it possessed everything it needed to produce those things. It had God for its force, it had God for its size, it had God for its power. You know, the Mississippi is less than three foot wide when it begins. But after the feeder streams flow into it, it becomes a mighty river. And yet God's river needs no feeder streams. All right. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. Doesn't need a world. Doesn't need night and day. God is self-existent. All right. And so what I mean is this. God doesn't need the world. Anything that's in it. He, and he certainly doesn't need me and you in order to get the work done here on this world. But God supersedes us. 
What does that mean? It means he supersedes the world. And he's going to get the job done with or without us. All right? Uh, his river never needs feeder streams. It doesn't need, uh, you know, Dr. Rick in order to take and get the gospel out. Now, he'll use Dr. Rick. That's me. He'll use me. But he doesn't have to have me. Well, I've said before, hey, this church will go on with or without me. Why? Because its source is God. Your source isn't the pastor. Your source isn't a program. Your source isn't the choir. Your source needs to come from God. So look in verse 8. Let's read verse 8 again. And he says, Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Verse 8. Then he said unto me, these waters issued out toward the east country and go down to the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea and the water shall be what? Healed. So I write this down. Verse eight, it could heal. This particular river could heal. The river made the seawater pure when it flowed into it. And the deadly effects of the, listen, if you were to drink seawater, salt water, you'd die. That's why if you're out in the ocean and you got all this water, it, you can't drink it. You'd have to purify it, go through a purification process. But this water that came out of the throne of God, Lady Karen, it had the ability to heal the seawater. All right? Made it drinkable, usable. All right? And I'm talking about a river uh, that has the power to heal today. I'm talking about the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And, and, and in my life. And he can heal the broken hearts. Uh, he can heal broken lives. And he can heal broken dreams. And he's a spirit who flows with healing and power tonight. No church can heal you. No preacher can heal you. But God can. You see, I challenge you to bring that which is broken to the Lord Jesus Christ. And watch him heal it. You say, my marriage is broken. Ask God to heal it. You say, my mind is going crazy. Ask God to heal it. You see, you say, man, my, my life, I, my social life, is, it, it's gone a, 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 astray. Ask God to heal it. You say, why? There is no source outside of God that can bring the healing in your life like the presence of God. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel. <coughs> To the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You see, in Luke four eighteen, he's talking about the Spirit of the Lord. He has a purpose in our life, not just something we experience it makes us want to shout and jump up and down, but something that brings a healing deep within. Jesus can take a broken life of sin that we talked about this morning in our main message. He can take a broken life of sin and through <coughs> the working of the Holy Spirit, He can bring healing into that soul. He can bring glory into that heart and that life that was a slave to sin. And people say, I'm so, Lupe, I'm so tired of living this way. Then ask God, the source, God, God, listen, change my life. Change the way I think. Change the way I love. Change, change what I'm doing. Help me to get rid of my excuses, Father. And so when the Spirit of God moves into a life, number nine, verse nine, it could revive. It can bring that which is dead alive. Let's go back to verse nine. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whatsoever the river shall come, shall what? Live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and, and everything shall live, whether the river cometh. So this river, this special river, that he, ta he saw uh, the, the river, he saw its source, he saw the course, he saw the force, he saw there were no feeder streams, and he saw that this thing had the ability to heal like none other. So in verse 9, it could also revive every uh, thing this river touched was transformed with its life-giving power. Some of you are going, and I, I'm, you know I'm a preacher. You know I pastor a church. But I, I want you to understand, there is not a building on this planet that we call a church that can change you. There's not a program that can. But there is a God who can change you. 
You see, why? Because the church can't revive you. I don't care if you've got 14 Bibles and, you, and they're all different versions. They, they can't revive you. You see, the source is God. Luby, the only thing that's going to revive us, it's not the preacher, it's not the program, it's the, not the name on the building, but it's the presence of the Lord. And so, by the way, the Holy Spirit is what our churches need today. We don't need a new song. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to get that revival going. What is revival? That's where God has, has gone back in and, and, and you've got a, and the power of God got a hold of you. Right in your midst. The power of God that can help you get rid of your addictions. The power of God that can take and put your marriage back together. The power of God that can put a church back together. A nation back together. And a world back together. You see when the Spirit of God moves into a life. There's going to be renewal. Write that down out beside verse 9. You see the Spirit of God moves into a life. There's going to be renewal. When God moves in, He will change some things. Now, uh, I think Lady Karen, this is a bold statement, but it can take that which was dead and make it live. That which was dead. People say, I don't get nothing out of church. It's because you're dead. Spiritually. Ephesians 2, 1 through 4 talks about that. He can and He will give a drink of, of water of life that will produce everlasting life and eternal satisfaction in the life of the believer. See, when you got saved, you came alive. Something happened, though. You let the flesh take back over. You let the world squeeze itself in. And now then, that going to church doesn't seem exciting anymore for some people. Reading their Bible is no longer exciting. Why? It's become dead. But thank God in verse 9, this river, this presence of God can revive. All right? And, and so look at verse 12. Not only could it revive, but it, it could bring forth fruit and freshness. Look in verse 12. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on the side uh, uh, and on that side shall grow all trees for meat. Whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth, what does it say? Help me out, help me out. New fruit according to his months. Because the waters they issued out of the sanctuary. You want to get back on fire with God? Get what God's producing from the sanctuary. And he says, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So, verse 12, this, it said, these waters, it could bring forth fruit and freshness. Everything that, that, that this great river flowed to, fruit sprang up. Oh my gosh, somebody help me preach on that one. When the Holy Spirit of God really begins to move in, in a, an organization of people, we call it the church, when it moves in you as an individual, then all of a sudden fruit and freshness shows up. So it is with the presence of the Holy Spirit. When He moves, uh, moves us, His presence is going to be manifested by the fruit and the freshness of life uh, in every believer. John chapter 7, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. John 7, 39. But this spake He of the Spirit, Notice the capital letter S, God the Spirit, which they that believe on Him should receive the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. See, the only way to get the Holy Ghost was for Jesus to die. And He said, now that I'm, when I die, I will send you the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm a Baptist, you know that. He didn't say, when, whenever I die, I'll make you a Baptist. I'll make you a, a, a church of Christ. I'm going to make you a Catholic. No. He said, I, I, he said I'm not going to make you denominational. Here's what I'm going to make you. I'm going to make you new and fresh that you'll bring forth fruit. So it's not about the name of the church, is it? It's about whether or not if you go to that church, whether or not you're getting a hold of the name that's flowing into that church. All right? And he says, so Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, he talked about fruit. So verse 12, it could bring forth fruit and freshness. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The Bible says in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Galatians 5, 23, meekness, temperance, 
Against such there is no law. So contrast this fruit with that of the flesh. The flesh doesn't produce those things. Only the Spirit of God. And all these pictures of the work of the Holy Spirit is, is, is saving us. using, And they're saving us so we can be in a position that we as a believer can bring glory and honor back to God. The land that was dead is now bringing glory and honor back to God. The trees that were dead are now growing again, producing fruit. When our eyes are open, it is easy to see where the Spirit is moving and working. Write this down. Sin closes our eyes. Oh, am I preaching by myself tonight? Sin, sin closes our eyes. But when our eyes are opened by God, it's easy to see where the Spirit is moving and where the Spirit is working. So what does it say? He saw. He saw. Sadly, many hear the gospel call in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Many see what the Spirit can and is doing in their lives and in others. Yet this is far, uh, 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 as far as they get. They just saw. They didn't experience. He said, I saw the river. I saw the power. I saw where it came from. I saw it. But he hadn't experienced it yet. Many see the river flowing, but they never get wet. Oh, I can camp here for a while. Many go to church, but they never get wet. They'll read a few verses of their Bible, their little Bible study, but never get wet. You see, they never experience, you know, the, the waters of God. For this river to do you any good, you had to get into it. Okay, somebody just say, oh me, oh my. You've got to get into it. John 3, 7. Marvel not thy saying to thee, you must be born again. There are a lot of people who go to church, they think they're saved, but they're not. They never, they never got wet. What does that mean? They never experienced the flowing river of God. They heard the preacher talk about it, heard the singers sing about it. They saw people jumping up and down, maybe, whatever, trying to experience something. But he says, you know what? You need to experience the river for yourself. So the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And Philip said, if thou believest, now listen, if thou believest in thy heart, he says, thou mayest. And he said, and answer said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then and only then did they go down into the river and he got baptized. So what is it that hinders you tonight? Have you, have you stepped out by faith and really put your faith in Jesus Christ? Why? Whenever we look at Ezekiel's vision in verses 3, uh, uh, verses three and 4, we see the, uh, Ezekiel's venture. As a man of Ezekiel's uh, a vision, he measures the river. He, he carried Ezekiel along with him. Do you get that? This angelic being is going to measure the river and take Ezekiel with him. And as the result, the prophet was led into an ever-deepening waters. See, when we start really getting into God, let God get into us. Why, Lupe, he begins to lead us into something deeper than just going to church. Something deeper than just reading a few verses of the Bible. Something deeper than just turning on the radio and, saying, and singing you know, all these little Christian songs. That God says, no, you, don't get, you, don't, you ain't got it. He said, what I want you to do is to experience me. And so the Spirit, Lady Karen, in verses 3 through 4, why? He says, when the man that had the line in his hand, verse 3, look at this. And in his hand went forth eastward. He measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. And then if you look down there in verse 4, it went from the ankles to the knees and then to the loins. And then in verse 5, it became a river that was so forceful and running that it just carried him along with it. Ankle deep. This represents the step of faith that saves the soul. 
In Acts chapter 16, 31, in Psalms uh, 34, 8, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that puts his trust in him. So it's truly, it's great to be saved. In fact, everybody needs to be saved. But it's not the end of it. That's the beginning. And so he wants to lead us, each and every one of us. Many stop right there. They never go a step farther. They got saved and quit going to church. They might have got saved. and They might have gotten even in a baptistry. They quit going to church. They quit reading their Bible. Why? There's much more to being saved than just getting saved. There's experiencing God. So ankle deep. This is where the waters become stagnant, right? Those who get saved and refuse to grow in the Lord are just dabblers. They're just dabbling with God, testing the water. That's why people go, from, hi, Bobby, glad to have you. That's why people go from church to church to church to church. They go from Bible to Bible to Bible to Bible. They go from choir to choir to choir, program to program to program. Why? They're just dabbling. In the waters. So here in Ezekiel chapter 47, getting in over your head, this is probably a really needed and powerful sermon, not only for, for me, but also for you as a reminder. Those who get saved and, and those who refuse to grow in the Lord, they're just dabblers. They might read their Bible only if the pastor says, open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 47. They spend all their time in the shallow end of the pool. You know what we call the shallow end of the pool, Loopy? The baby pool. Did you get that? We're in the baby pool. Most Christians today are very weak in their faith. They're in the baby pool. All right? They miss the blessings of the deeper life. And the people are in total, absolute control, you think, of their lives, but they're not. You see, until you get out of the baby pool, you'll never know what it's like to swim. All you can do is lay out there and paddle. Look like a wounded duck. We talked about ducks this morning. Have you ever watched the children in the kiddie pool? It's amazing. They remind me a lot of church members today. Of people always yelling, always screaming, wanting somebody else's pool that's in the toy, doing their best to splash someone, push someone else under. Sounds just like many of the folks in our church today, doesn't it? Playing around, making a lot of noise. But notice, not only did he go ankle deep, but he said, this is not enough. God said, and he let, he let the, the man that's leading him now in Ezekiel 47, he dragged him through the waters and he looks down. Now he's what? Knee deep. What is that? Knee. The knee has to do with prayer. The presence of life that's a learning dependence on the Lord. And, and this, uh, this is the person who prays and is trying to live their life by, in faith before the Lord. Hebrews 10, 38. Many never reach even the shallow end of the level of maturity in the Lord. And you need to remember, however, that no person will ever, ever, ever stand taller than they do uh, 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 on their knees. Did you get that? You say, how do I get taller in Christ? You get on your knees and you connect to God in a very real spiritual way. You see, it's not how tall I stand. In fact, if I'm growing in the Lord, my knees ought to come into play. So those who are at the, level, at the knee level, something about the power of the river, at knee level, at ankle level, Luffy, you can't feel the water. But at knee level, level uh, uh, Victoria, you begin to feel the force of the water around your legs. You know, you know, you're not fully affected by it. Now, Lady Karen, they're still standing in their own two feet of water. They're in control of their lives. They aren't being supported by the river. Somebody say amen. All right. Now then, he grabs him. He got him into the ankles. Got him into the knees. We begin to feel the little bit of the power and the movement of the, of the water that's coming from the altar of God, the presence of God. But then he gets in loins deep. The loins is a, a, a symbol of, of, of strength. This speaks of the spiritual power in our lives. And when one has waded out waist deep into the river, more of the river takes over your body and less of the man is seen. Do you get that? Hey, you're up to your, up to your waist. Uh, we don't see a lot of that man anymore. Oh, to God today that, that Bobby, that you and I and all of those that are listening and Starla and all those that are here and all, everybody else. Listen, I, wouldn't it be great if we could grow in a way spiritually 
that instead of seeing me standing, they only see the half of me and knowing that God is still working on me. Less of me and more of him. In, in John 3.30, when, when we have waded out this far, we can feel the power of the river and others see its effect on us. They see that we're, we're losing that fleshly control and, and that rivers begin to have an effect on us. Ephesians 6.10 the level of maturity is rarely reached. But when it is, you cannot hide its effects. It will, t- it will tell on you. As deep as this level of spiritual maturity of growth is still not as deep as we can go. Did you get that? Well, I preacher, I got to where I love going to church. I love reading my Bible. I love singing those songs. I just can't wait for the next service. We're seeing the effects of a godly river on you. But you still, somebody say it out loud, not deep enough. Not deep enough. All right? So to, to few who are at this level of spiritual maturity, have uh, maybe you, you, you say, I, I'm finally losing control of the flesh as the Spirit of God takes over. They're often picked up by the river and they're often moved a few feet at a time. You ever been in a river? I've been in a river. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, you're standing there in the river and the water starts running. All of a sudden, it kind of picks you up and moves you. You realize you're not in control anymore. You realize that, hey, listen, something else is taking over. That's where we need to be in our spiritual lives. We're not standing on our own two feet anymore. God's going to pick us up. He's going to move us around. But still, they're they're still close enough, though, uh, and everything, Victoria, to the shore that they're able to maybe kind of swim that way and get back their own control. But here we see Ezekiel's vision, his venture. But we see in verse 5, listen, his victory. Go back to verse 5, if you will. Ezekiel chapter 47. He said, afterwards, he measured a thousand. Look at this, look at this, look at this. And it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. I can't swim it. It is absolutely engulfed me. It's taken over me. And that ought to be our desire tonight. Lord, take over me. Just engulf me, Father. At this point, Ezekiel had reached a place where the river is in control. Somebody say hallelujah. That's important. Why? What's the river going to do? Why? This is what's amazing to me. It's going to take you wherever God wants you to go. It's going to move you wherever God wants to move you. It takes him at his will and he no longer has the power over its destination. Oh, what am I going to do for God? Let God decide that. He already has. Let God pick you up. Let God, just let God sweep you up and take you where He wants to take you. Be at the mercy of the river. Be at the mercy of God's river. You see, this represents the highest spiritual level of any believer that can reach in their life. He couldn't, he said, I can't pass over. It just doesn't get any deeper than this. You see, there are three reasons why I say that I can say that this is the deepest you can ever get as a Christian. Number one, when you are this deep, when you are totally in the river of God and you've gone beyond your own ability. Somebody right out beside that verse. Go beyond your own ability. Lord, I can't do it, but you can. Ezekiel was at that total mercy of the river. He was far too... Far too many like the safety of the shore. But Ezekiel was away from the shore now. And this person who has reached this level of spiritual maturity has moved beyond him or herself. And, 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 and say, they're doing things they could never have done on their own. Jane, glad to have you. Wayne, glad to have you. We're in Ezekiel chapter 47, getting in over your head. This is one of those messages you want to go back and you want to listen to and listen to and listen to and share, share, share. That's what spiritual maturity is all about. It's about coming to the end of ourselves and realizing just how big this thing really is. Listen, this thing with God, it's big, it's big, it's really big, it's bigger than you can imagine. You can't look at the universe and not know how big your God is. But he said, I got in that river of God that came from the throne of God. It overtook me and I didn't realize how big this thing is. And there's no way that we can ever do this on our own. We, we come to a place where we realize who's in control, Philippians 4.13. You see, I'm not in control of this building, God is. I'm not in control of this ministry, God is. But the key is, i, I got to get to where I'm not in control of me anymore. And realize that 
God, I give you all the control over my mind, my heart, my destiny. So when you're at this deep level, you'll cease, listen, you'll cease to support yourself. Ezekiel was no longer waiting. He was just resting and floating. Can you imagine? Who are you? I'm a bobber with Jesus. Amen. I'm just bobbing around. Wherever God takes me, that's where I'm going to go. Hey, I didn't choose Lubbock, Texas. But because I got involved in the river of God, God placed me here in Lubbock. My wife says, why Lubbock? Why Lubbock? Right? I didn't, I didn't, in fact, I always said I'd never live in Lubbock, Texas. Don't tell God you ain't going to do it. When you, get to, when you get in that river of God, that flow of God, all of a sudden you're going to bob around and go, oh, wow, I'm in Lubbock, Texas, pastoring a church, right? So what? You see, until you get to that place to where you realize you no longer support yourself, listen, then as long as you're supporting yourself, God is not in charge. He gave himself over to the power of the river. Now I want you to write that down in Ezekiel 47. He chose, he gave himself over to the power of the river. And this is where God wants uh, 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 to bring you and me tonight. You see, he wants us to reach a place where we, we learn to rest in him and allow him to support us and to carry us through this life. And, and, I, and I will no longer uh, uh, be you trying to run around and get things done yourself. What do you mean? Hey, boy, if I can just get more members, if I can just build that church, if I can just build that ministry, quit and let God do it. One preacher one time said, you know, he said, we, we trust God to build our church. And I'm out there knocking doors, 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 knocking doors. Day number two, knocking doors, knocking doors, knocking doors. Day number three, knocking doors. Nobody's coming. And then I finally just one day said, Lord, this is yours. If you don't build, it ain't worth building. So, Lord, would you, I'm going to sit back and watch you build it. Did you know within about six months, we were just blowing the doors out of this place? I will no longer be trying to run around and get things done all by myself. It will be, you say, what is it? It's you resting in the power of the Holy Spirit, watching the Lord conduct and do His business as He carries you along with it. That's where we need to be. Lord, not my will, but what? Thy will be done. When you are this deep, you have given yourself up to the will of the river. Ezekiel uh, was going to go where the river took him. This is how the Lord wants you and I to be today. He wants, to lose, uh, 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 si he wants us to lose sight of ourselves and lose sight of our own goals and, and our ambitions and our dreams. And he wants us to be totally 100% surrendered to him and he will direct your life. God is looking for surrender from you and from me. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And as we close this out, when you are this deep, you're just as happy. You're, in fact, you're more happy to be carried by the river. The, the will of the river becomes your will also. Not my will, but thy will be done. This is where we all are commanded. Ephesians 5, 18, Galatians 5, 25, and 1 John 2, 6. Basically, Ezekiel, he, he's all wet. He's been submerged. He's tumbled a couple times. I mean, whatever God, he said, I'm out of control. I'm just going to go with God. He was into something that was over his head. That, my friend, is where God wants you to be. Let God get you in a place that's over your head. Let the Spirit of God. Remember, where, did, where was the source? It was from the throne of what? The throne of God. And where did it come from? The altar of God. Everything begins and is and will continue to be because of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the secret to real revival is? It's nothing more than for God's people to get to a place where they are so deep in Him that you can't get any deeper. That's where it is. No, we're, not, we're not talking about the ankle crowd. We're not talking about the knee crowd or the waist crowd. We're not talking about the chest crowd. Hey, we're talking about the one that says, hey, I am all, God, just, just take me where you want me to go. Just let me experience you. And even though those who are out uh, uh, to their loins, they be, they'll go to church and feel a little bit of the tugging of this power of God and a tugging of the Word of God and a tugging of the Spirit of God. God says, don't just feel the tugging. Just jump in. Get all wet. Let God have absolute right to your life. Not just a Sunday every now and then. Not just maybe a Wednesday, but every day of your life. 
And I, I want you to notice that in verses 3 and 4, he says, He brought me through the waters. <laughs> he brought me through. I didn't do it on my own. I couldn't do it on my own. He brought me through. Some of you are holding back because, and, and on, on total commitment to the Lord this evening because you're afraid that if you fully sell out to God that you'll drown. God will never let you drown. Some, some of the saints have walked through some mighty deep waters over the centuries and, and God brought them out. Well, I can talk to you about Job and the three Hebrew children and Daniel and the disciples and my friend. I can talk about you and talk about me. God's brought us through a lot. But the deeper you go, the harder it is to jump out. Somebody say hallelujah. You got what I'm saying? When you're in the kiddie pool, you can jump out whenever you want. But when you're over your head, you can't jump out. You just have to be carried away. So what do you do? Let's just get a little deeper tonight. Let's make a commitment. Completely sell out to God. Don't stay in the shallows. Say, Jesus, I want to get in the deep end. I want to get out there so deep, I can't get out of this thing. Somebody says, why don't you quit the ministry? I'm in over my head. Why don't you quit the church? I'm over my head with God. Why don't you get out of that marriage? I'm over my head with God. Are y'all getting this tonight? Just get all wet with God. Jump in with everything you've got. Trust God with everything you've got. So the old saying, wait out a little bit deeper. Wait out. You see, that sounds fine. But listen, until you're willing to take and make your decision for Jesus Christ tonight, and jump in with everything you got and say, Jesus, like the thief on the cross, I'm all in. When you die, I want to go to where you're going. You've got a kingdom, I want to go there. I'm all in. How many here want to be all in to go to heaven? All in. Well, what about now? You say, I want to be saved. But there's more of the salvation than just being saved. There's experiencing God at a very deep level. Why not tonight say, Holy Spirit of God, I'm letting go of me. And I'm just going to jump in and trust you. I want, to, I want to experience that river. That river that flows from the throne of God, from the altar of God. I don't want to be this dry Christian anymore. I don't want to be this dry husband anymore. Or maybe a dry wife. I don't want to be a dry teenager. I want to get all wet. I just want to be so full and soaked up with the word of God, the presence of God, that Lord, I just want to take and bring healing to whatever I touch with your direction. Father, I pray tonight there be one here that's lost. They've played the church game. They've played the going from church to church to church to church, denomination to denomination. Lord, we throw that out. Lord, we come to you based on the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb which takes away the sins of the world. Lord Jesus, like the thief on the cross, I'm guilty. I'm going to die. But I believe in you. I believe you're the Savior. I believe that you're dying and paying for my sin, Dad. And I know that when you die, you're going to go to your kingdom and you're going to be there. But would you remember me? And that thief on the cross, he jumped all in by faith. He said, Lord, remember me. And Lord, you turned to him and said, today, today, not tomorrow, today, not later, right this very second, now, 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 today, thou will be with me in paradise. May your prayer be today, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. Come into my heart, into my life. Save me by your blood. Give me a home in heaven with you when I die. But as I live, I invite the Holy Spirit of God to come into me. I want all of it. I want my mind to change. I want my heart to change. I want my life to change. That wherever I go by your leadership, that whatever you use me, whatever we touch in the name of Jesus, that lives will be altered and changed, starting with mine. I love you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. And I'm excited that I want to be saying, thy will be done, not mine. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise. And I pray that all of you will say the same. God bless you all. Love you in the Lord. See you at the next get-together.